Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another segment of Condo Insider. It is our weekly show that is um, put on by Hawaii Council of Hawaii Council of Community Associations. And so today, I have with me as my host or my guest is um, John Morris, who's an attorney with Ekimoto and Morris Morris and Ekimoto. Um, but he's been a condo attorney for for a long, long time. Um, and we're going to talk today about. Um, the importance of restating our condo condominium documents. So we start off with um, declarations and bylaws. So John, why don't you explain to us, because I know we have some viewers that are that are new to being on their board. Why don't you explain to us what those two documents are? Okay, well, <clears throat> generally the condominium declaration is what divides up the project. So the whatever the form of your condominium, it, it will be a single or a one project. And so what the declaration does is divide up, primarily divides up the project into units, um, common elements, which is areas owned by everyone, <clears throat> and then limited common elements, which are part of the common elements, which, which are designated for the use by fewer than all owners, sometimes one owner, sometimes a group of owners. So essentially that's the primary purpose of the declaration. And the condominium law does state certain things it has to include, has to cover certain topics. Um, it, for example, will state the common interest for each unit, that type of thing. The bylaws are primarily focused on how the association runs, how it operates, what it can do, um, what the owners can do, that sort of thing. So the bylaws are primarily to do with operations. In real life terms, it often depends on the developer's attorney. Sometimes the developer's attorney will put what you might consider operations issues into the declaration. Sometimes the bylaws will include more about use of units, dividing up the project, how the project's use. And then typically the house rules under the condominium law, they are primarily supposed to focus on controlling the use of the common elements, not as much controlling the use of the units, although sometimes they can be used for that purpose, but that's primarily what the house rules are supposed to be, which is controlling the use of the common elements by the residents of the project. And the distinction really is that the Declaration and bylaws usually require owner approval, 67%, sometimes 75%, um, whereas the house rules can usually be amended by the board alone without any owner approval, although the board often has to present them as a draft to the owners before the um, board adopts the house rules to give the owners a chance to provide input. But primarily house rules, the board can amend without owner approval. Declaration and bylaws requires owner approval. So that's the primary three main documents. You sometimes have other documents, but if you're a condominium, those are the three main documents that um, govern your condominium project. So I've, I've owned condos since for, for way back. And I often heard, even being on a board member, I've often heard a discussion about restating our documents. So what exactly does that mean? Yes, um, that was added to the condominium law a long time ago, back in 1989. And basically what it allows is two things. It allows, and again, this is where it allows the board alone to restate, doesn't need owner approval. So it says, um, I think the, the purpose, the reason restatement came about was because almost every year, the legislature changes the condominium law. So a lot of buildings would have something in their bylaws say on how the annual meeting is supposed to be conducted, how the um, proxies are supposed to be written. And it would be out of date because the legislature would have changed the law. So one of the main purposes of the restatement process is to allow the board to restate the declaration and bylaws so that 
what they state is consistent with the law, which often means changing provisions in the Declaration and Bylaws because they are no longer consistent with the law. So that's one purpose. And this was quite a, a, a bit of a problem at the time because owners would accuse the board of violating the Declaration and Bylaws when in fact the board was following the changes to the law. And then the second main reason for restatement is in buildings where there have been a lot of amendments, you know, you start off with your declaration, your bylaws, but then unfortunately, there can be a lot of amendments and those can be very confusing because on a particular topic, you can't just look at the declaration or the bylaws. You have to look at the amendments to the declaration of bylaws and sometimes a section in the Declaration and Bylaws has been amended more than once. So you have to search through this numerous amendments to get the final version. So that was the second purpose of restatement, that you could take all those amendments and incorporate them into a single document so that when you looked at the restated Declaration, restated bylaws, you would see all, the, all of the amendments incorporated into that single document. So that, that's the primary two purposes of restatement. And there is, when they, when they adopted the uh, new condominium law 514b, they added a third purpose for restatement. And so um, the current law, which is 514b109 says, the board can also restate the documents if the common interest do not add up to 100. Sometimes I guess the developers' arithmetic skills are not as good as they should be. And they um, give everybody a common interest, but when you add it all up, it's not a, it doesn't equal 100, which it's supposed to. So the third part of the restatement process, it allows you to restate the declaration to correct the common interest, because the common interest is stated in the declaration, not the bylaws. So that's the third purpose for restatement. And, um, you, and again, that I should emphasize that as long as the board follows the law, they can restate the documents without any owner approval. There is a procedure, they have to adopt a resolution saying that's what they're gonna do. And um, that's something they do do as part of the process. But second, or maybe the next question would be, what are the downsides of doing this? And I guess the biggest downside tends to be the cost. You have to take the old declaration, you usually have to scan it on, convert it to a Word or a Word perfect document. So you can start the restatement process. So that can take a while. Incorporating the prior amendments into the restated declaration of bylaws is not too difficult. The hard part is when the attorney, some boards try this too, you have to look at what's in the declaration, what's in the bylaws, and then compare it to what's in the law. And you have to actually amend that provision in the Declaration of Bylaws to be consistent with the law, which isn't always that easy. So it's, it's a little like freehand. It's not where it's necessarily that simple. So that, that's what can take the time. So the restatement process can cost the association, depending on whether they do both the Declaration and the Bylaws, maybe six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars because it'll take an attorney quite a while to incorporate the prior amendments and then to do his or her creative selecting those provisions of the, the declaration bylaws which are not consistent with the current law and making the changes necessary to to do that. And so that that's the that's the main downside. It is quite a laborious process. I usually try and avoid it if I can. Um, but again, it does have its advantages. You get a nice clean document with all the current requirements of the law and all the prior amendments. 
And that's really what you're trying to achieve. And again, you are supposed to, the board is supposed to adopt a resolution saying, this is what we're planning to do. And the new law does actually have a few little requirements. It states in subsection B, um, it has to, so the restated declaration of bios has to identify each portion that's restated. Um, so when you change a section in the declaration of bylaws, you have to identify that. And um, how that's usually done is with little end notes. At the end of the restatement, you'll put these end notes saying section such and such was amended to be consistent with this provision of the condominium law or to take out something which may no longer be permitted by law, such as restrictions on children or things like that. So that's the first thing you have to do to do this right. Identify each provision in the or declaration of bylaws that has been restated. And then you have to say in the document, this is usually we put this at the front, those provisions have been restated solely for purposes of information and convenience. So this is, something the law requires. And again, you can put that in the front and you have to identify this again is not when you're, um, not when you're amending to put in the old amendments, but when you're amending to comply with the statute, the ordinance or a rule, you have to identify in these little end notes. So you put a little number by what you're changing. And then in the end note, you explain this is being changed to comply with such and such a portion of the condominium law, or sometimes it's just an ordinance, sometimes it's a rule. Um, so that's what you have to do. That's the third thing. And then you have to put a statement in the restatement that if there is a conflict between your restated declaration or bylaws, and this is of course stated in the law, um, the restatement is subordinate to the statute you cite or the ordinance or the rules. So they don't want you getting too carried away and saying, oh, well, this, this, this is not as good as it should be. Let me do a little bit of creative work. You have to say that you are following in your restatement, the statute, the ordinance and the rule. And if, if what you say in the restatement is inconsistent, the statute, the ordinance or the rule will control. So that's um, something you have to specifically include in the restatement when you're doing the restatement to make sure you comply with the law. And the law is very clear as well. If there's a conflict between your restatement and the original declaration, then um, your, your restatement is still subordinate to the declaration and bylaws as originally written. Of course, that would be subordinate subject to what the statute now says, but essentially that is the process you have to follow. And you're trying to um, do that and to, to, to cross all your T's, Dot all your eyes, you need the board resolution saying the board has decided our documents are out of date, they need work. We are going to be restating them. And then you have to have those points I mentioned. And then you have to record them, of course. You have to record the declaration and bylaws to make them um, fully effective. Until they're recorded, they're not necessarily fully effective. So, so that's essentially the process. It is set out if you're interested in section 514B109. And it does give you a fairly detailed outline. It says you can restate to incorporate old amendments and restate to incorporate newer provisions in the law. So that's essentially the process. Um, and it is rather laborious. It's not something you to look forward to. Now, if boards are worried about costs, they may say, what, $6,000, $9,000? They can get a head start by scanning 
the document and converting it to a Word document so that the attorney doesn't have to do that. So that will save some time and money. Now, of course, if they do a very poor job and the attorney has to proof it, well, that's not going to save as much time and money, but that's one way of doing it. Um, a very creative, proactive board could probably take a first draft of the restatement, look at the condominium law, cross-check that with provisions in the documents, and then send it to their attorney for review to make sure that what they did is consistent with the restatement provisions in the law. To be honest, I don't recall a board really doing that maybe once or twice in my 30 odd years, because it is, it is pretty difficult for someone, a lay person, a non-attorney to try to make sense of the law and then bring it together, mesh it with what's already in the declaration. But anyway, that, that is the basic process. It is fairly clearly outlined in the law and that would be what the board would have to do to be consistent with the requirements of the law. I personally have never restated a declaration to change the common interests. I have seen that there are situations where the common interests don't add up to 100, but say they add up to 99, um, you just slightly increase the total amount you're assessing and that takes care of the 1% discrepancy. So it's probably easier than trying to restate your declaration to make sure that the common interests add up to 100. But again, it's, it's up to individual boards. Some people might be concerned when their common interests don't add up to 100. So that's the process. Um, okay, so to restate it does not require ownership approval, right? No, that was one of the things that was as long as you follow the process, no owner approval is required. No. So you're gonna take their, and plus two, when you, like an argument from the board, okay? So I could, I'm just imagining this. Well, well it's gonna cost us $10,000, I'm gonna go for it. But, when, but as a condo attorney, you take on a client and they got these old, old and a bunch of amendments, you know, for you to properly like enforce, say a, um, there's been numerous house rule violations about one, one item or something, and it goes to an attorney. And now you're looking at their bylaws and the house rules to see where you know you can um, legally enforce it, but you're having to search through all these amendments and you're like, it, it, I'm thinking it's taking a, a lot of your time yes. to go through that. So you're kind of weighing the attorney time versus old documents versus paying the, the 10,000 or whatever it is for restating and being saving time in the future for any other law issues going yes, forward. Yes, I think that's a valid point that when you do have to dig through, when you look at a set of documents and you see all these amendments, when I pull them up, I have to look through them all because you're never quite sure what's been done in the past and you might focus on the wrong one. You know, if something's been amended two or three times and you'll be citing something to the owner and then they'll come back and say well that's not what it says which is pretty embarrassing so you you have to be quite careful and the other problem you have is the owner will say well where in the declaration and bylaws does it say that and then you have to say well it doesn't because your declaration and bylaws are no longer consistent with the law the law now says this and the legislature takes the position the law overrides what's in your declaration and bylaws if there's an inconsistency. So yeah, that's a good point. It does, it does make life easier for the board too. They only have to look at one document when they're trying to work out what they're supposed to do. So there, there are benefits. It isn't just an out-of-pocket cost that doesn't have any benefits. You, that's correct. How about when, um, when you're reviewing all the documents <clears throat> and you're making sure all the language is consistent with 514B, but you're also looking at maybe state law, like 5, 515 discrimination for housing. Yes. Stuff as well. Uh, that is a, a good, another good point. If you have, for example, in your documents, uh, maybe in your bylaws, children under the age of such and such are not allowed in the pool area, or 
you have an occupancy restriction, no more than two people in a one bedroom unit or something like that. You are correct. That can be a problem because the way the Civil Rights Commission and even HUD often interprets it is even if you never enforce that provision on, you know, no children in the pool who are less than 14 years old, whatever it might say, even if you don't enforce it, they take the position that just by having that in your documents, you are um, preventing people, people will look at that, they will be prevented from exercising their fair housing rights simply because you left something like that in your declaration of bylaws and they think it still applies. So even though the law says they don't have to, to abide by that restriction, if you leave it in your documents, they'll say that that in and of itself, just having it in there can be a violation because it, it dampens the willingness of people to exercise their fair housing rights because they say, well, I don't think this is right, but this is what the bylaws say, or this is what the declaration says. So that's another good point that you do have to, it isn't just chapter 514B, it is uh, chapter 515, which deals with discrimination and, and even some other provisions you have to be aware of. So but it's true. Even they yeah. bought the unit, um, they agreed to the, I mean, you know, they read all the documents. There's another statute that still obligates them to comply. Even though it's not enforced, they still have to comply. So there's that, you know, that little gray area kind of a thing, right? Yes, there, is, there can be not everything that a condominium owner is required to do is in the condominium law. That's probably really the basic point you're making. They are, the condominium law itself says, um, this law is subject to city ordinances, other state laws. So it isn't the end of the inquiry, just because you don't find it in your bylaws, you don't find it in your declaration or even in the condo law doesn't mean you aren't subject to certain legal requirements because like anybody else, you're subject to not just the condominium law as a condo owner, but all the other laws that might apply to a particular situation. So that's true, yes. Um, <clears throat> condo docs always seem to be a big hot topic or um, you know, um, a topic with a lot of people, especially realtors where they can't get it. Lenders sometimes can't get it, when they're, especially yeah. when they're trying to do a mortgage. Um, so what's your take? Because you know, with ACCA, we've been trying to encourage them to put certain documents onto the website or like in Town Square or one of the other apps that they're starting to use now. So they don't have to go into these requests. You know, like your house rules, decorations yes. house can be yeah. easily posted and they can access it themselves, you know? So what's your take on that? Uh, yes particularly um, with the declaration bylaws, they are recorded. So under the theory of the law, when something is recorded, even if you didn't read it, it still applies to you. So there's really no reason if something's recorded in the Bureau of Conveyances or Land Court, there's no reason you can't put it on a website, either something like Town Square, or just if the association has its individual website, the governing documents are no secret, you know, the house rules, the declaration bylaws. So making them accessible, you hope, will make people more aware of them and more willing to comply with them. Because it is, as you say, it is true. Some people never read them. They don't even know about them. They buy in and it's a big surprise, even though they're usually given them when they buy. Right. They don't bother. They just put that to one side. I often say to people, you remember that big stack of documents that you were given when you bought your unit? You might want to look in there and you'll see that what I'm saying is based on that. So it is true. It's often not read, but because it is recorded, it's public, it's a public document. So there's no reason to hold it back from yeah, and I, posting yeah, on the website. People, well, we don't have a computer in it. So I tell people like, you know, Resident Magic, keep a couple copies handy so that you can hand them out to yeah. house rules. I mean, I had yeah. someone that was like, you know, they wanted to charge with house rules. Like, oh, why? You want them to comply. Why are you making yeah. it painful? You know, so I'm yes. like, just give it out freely. No, 
it is it is worth letting people know because then they don't have an excuse you can say hey we gave you these if you didn't bother to read them that's your problem not ours you have to comply okay so what's your advice to the boards that have old old outdated documents and then they have like beyond five amendments since then Yes, I think, you know, the, probably the way to look at it is long term. It may seem like a big charge up front. And again, as I say, if they want to go to the trouble of um, scanning them on, having a committee to proof them, get them into good shape, that can help. But you, you probably want to look upon it as a long term investment that, OK, you've had the, the, your documents have been in existence 30, 40, 50 years. If you restate them, they can at least be good for, you hope, another 10, 20 years. So you should be dividing the cost out over the future and looking upon the convenience that you will get from having a restatement done. I think that's the way to look at it. But it, it, is, it is nice to look at, when I look at a project I represent, I look at it. A, a set of documents and I see two restatements, I think, oh, thank God, I don't have to worry about all the rest of the stuff in this file because the restatements are newer than everything else. So they should include everything else. And so it, it is a convenience, yeah. And it, so actually, it actually means we might be able to do things quicker for them than if we have to wade through all the amendments they've made. Right, and that's a that's an attorney cost to the association. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. It's time spent, which is um, generally how it's built. So actually, the restatement should also be a reserve item because you want to kind of do it, look at doing you, it maybe every step. So you many could, years. yeah. You could make a contingency reserve because I think in the last thirty odd years that I've been involved with condominiums, I can't remember a single year where the legislature didn't change the condominium law. So okay. it is something you know that 10 years from now, your restatement will not be as current as it is the day it's completed, simply because the law will keep changing. So that's true too. You can look upon it as a some kind of an investment that you will you know, put aside the money so you'll have the money on hand 10 years from now to do a second restatement or Something like that, yeah. <clears throat> so we're um, we're out out of time. That went really quick. Um, yeah. But John, I really want to thank you for um, spending your time today um, with me on Condo Insider and educating yeah. us on restating the importance of restating the documents um, yeah. because ultimately it's really going to cost the association more in the long run if they don't take the time and investment to do it uh, periodically. Yeah. Yes, I think that's true. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.